Hi everyone! Welcome to the final video from Emma Novella in 2020. I'm so glad to see the back of this year and I am also procrastinating really fucking hard so we need to just do this video because I have shit to do in such as reading nearly 300 pages in three and a half hours so love that for me. Today we're going to do a sort of mishmash of multiple videos. I have had a eh, year, right? Reading wise, I've read a hundred and something books, like 150, 116, I don't know. It's been kind of average. There have been outstanding books, there have been at least one really fucking bad one, but like nothing is like, I'm not saying like, oh my gosh, like I have so many books that can go into my top 10. Like I don't have a top 10. So I didn't have content to make a best of. I didn't have content to make a worst of. We will get to that in a minute. Nor did I have enough for most surprising, most disappointing. So I'm gonna do those four things mixed with Boston's bookish superlatives tag. So we're gonna talk about some of the books I read this year in some capacity. Listen, I don't know. <laughs> on that note, I've been making bookish content on and off for nearly six years. And very rarely in that time, have I felt the need to stand in front of the camera and explain that what I am discussing are my personal opinions on what I have read. I have never felt the need to clarify that I am not some be all and end all expert who can tell you 100% the quality of a book. I feel I make it perfectly clear that I am a dumbass bitch and you shouldn't listen to me. <laughs> so, I really don't feel like I need to sit here and be like, don't be offended if I don't like your favourite book, blah 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 blah, right? Because I feel like the community as a whole understands that. But I know that I'm probably going to have like best and worst books of 2020 in my title and that is going to bring all those authors that went for Gavin out into the crevice, out, out of the cracks, that's the term. <laughs> Told you, dumb bitch. It's going to pull these people out and they're going to be like, oh, be nice to creatives. I am a creative, okay? Not just doing this, like my literal job is an artist. And I am telling you to shut the fuck up. <laughs> I'm not gonna make this a whole video about it because I really could, but I will sit here and I will slander a book as much as I want because it is how I feel. Books are supposed to make you feel something. And Honestly, I could use an unhaul. So if any authors I happen to own either here or at my mum's house decide to like reveal their asses for not liking negative reviews, I mean I'm not saying you have to like a negative review, but you know, th there's there's not liking negative reviews and then there's actively talking about them as if they are actually a bad thing, when actually negative reviews are some of the most helpful. Not the point. We're gonna get onto it. I'm probably gonna shit talk a book and people are probably gonna come at me and I'm so fucking ready. <laughs> start with Boston's bookish superlatives because why not? I don't know, it's what the order is on my little spreadsheet thing that I made to like keep my brain engaged. Our first prompt is most likely to make a comeback and this is a reread that you loved even more the second time and I feel like I'm cheating because I'm going with a book that I also read for the first time this year and reread this year. Oh my god, I actually have two of those. So I have an honourable mention I just thought of <laughs> when I was about to answer and that is an absolutely remarkable thing. I read this in February, reread it just before the sequel came out, loved it both times. However, the true answer to this could be none other than A Kind of Spark by Elle McNichol. This is my arc, I read it back, oh my god, like months ago and I really enjoyed it, blah blah blah, all that good stuff. And then I just reread it last week and it just hit me so much more and I just, I can't deal with it. Just, yeah, like, this, if you don't know, is about a girl called Addie who has autism. She's, I want to say she's 10, 11. Her big sister, Kitty, also has autism. Kitty's twin does not. And it's just, it's just... Mm, mm. It is spot on representation. Now that might be because I personally relate to Addie and I have went through the things that she went through. Saying that, she was she is diagnosed in this. Well, at primary school, I was not diagnosed until last year at 22 years old. So there is major differences between me and Addie. But just the way she spoke about things and how she feels was just, it got me. I'm planning to buy a copy from my mum and like other people I know to be like, this is me. 
read it. The next prompt is class clown, funniest book or character. And I genuinely can't think of any, like there's nothing really popping into my head where I'm like, oh yeah, that was really funny. Or like, oh, I remember liking that character because they were funny. Like, I just, I don't have anything for it. So we're gonna bypass that. And then we're gonna move to best cover, which, well, best dress, which is prettiest cover. Listen, it's the end of the year, I'm not with it. Again, there are so many books I could pick for this. Um, I have three because I couldn't help myself. So first is actually a book that came out this year and that is You Will Be Found. So this is the Dear Evan Hansen song, You Will Be Found, but illustrated and it's just, the whole, the whole book is stunning. So like, I actually have four art prints. They're still most, I think all of them, bar this one's not in its cellophane. I have actual like massive large prints of pages from the book. That's how much I just think it is stunning. I also have a book that has been published for years now and that is The Fox and the Star. Funnily enough, I have my Fox and the Star tattoo. Um, you Will Be Found was illustrated by <laughs> the artist who illustrated, well didn't quite illustrate my tattoo, but my tattoo's inspired by the book they illustrated. <laughs> so clearly, clearly if Emma likes a book, she gets it tattooed. And funnily enough, the artist that I got like tattooed who did that book, the book they did the art for, was a Kemi Don Bowman. Not this book, but one of their other books. <laughs> um, but The Infinity Course, this doesn't come out until 2021, but I am just obsessed with this cover. If you're wondering why this is like, the cover is not on the whole thing, this is a bound manuscript, not even an arc. Um, but yeah, it's, it's gorgeous. Next is cutest, cu 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 cu. Next is cutest couple, which is obviously, no. Yeah, cutest couple, best romance. I don't read romance. I read books that have romance, like I don't care. I have just finished Actor Age Eve Brown, but it took me almost two months to read. So, <laughs> We're going with nothing for that. Like, it would take a lot for me to truly root for a romance. Like, even romance books I've read, I'm like, oh, they're a cute couple, I like them. I'm not, like, invested enough to award them best couple, so. <laughs> then it is most likely to make you cry, which is self-explanatory. And there is only one answer for this, and this is the book. This book is the reason I did not do this video before today. Now, I know it is literally the 31st of December and I am still reading a book, but I just know it's not gonna be a favorite. But I read this book, I finished it like two days ago. I sobbed. So I like never cry. I'm not a big crier movie. Like, okay, don't get me wrong. Like things like Children in Need or like Pride of Britain and stuff, like that can make me cry, but fiction doesn't tend to get me. However, The Travelling Cat Chronicles made me cry twice. Made me call my mum at like midnight and make her go and get my cat so I could see him. <laughs> I actually went into the house yesterday just to see the cat. That's how much this book got me. Kind of spoilers, but not really. The cat doesn't die, so like it's fine. <laughs> um, oh, this just got me. Like I, I like reading this. Like this, this is probably my best week of the year. Spoiler for later in the video, but this is why <laughs> I did not do my best of last week because I just I knew I just knew if I did it something like this would come along and it did so. Then we have Most Dramatic, another sort of self-explanatory, a dramatic book. And I wasn't really sure if I had an answer for this, but I did watch Boston's video, I kind of skipped through it. And for this prompt, she said Tiny Pretty Things, which I also read this year. I must have my, I think a couple books I took back to my mom's house. So I'd say too bad, I gave to her to take back semantics. Um, so Tiny Pretty Things is a pretty dramatic book. I need to get the sequel so I can watch, I mean I'm saying need the sequel so I can watch a TV show. I did only give this like three stars. I liked it, I just didn't love it. So I might just skip reading the sequel and watch the TV show but this was definitely very dramatic. Then we have Most Changed and Least Changed. So these are for sequels. Most Changed being, you know, a sequel that like changed everything up and Least Changed being it felt like coming home. And honestly, I, I don't know. The two books that I kind of want to talk about for both of these prompts are The Vanishing Stare and A Beautifully Foolish Endeavour. I feel like they both felt like coming home because like The Vanishing Stare, I still just felt like I was back reading um, Truly Devious, back at Ellen Academy and all of that. A Beautifully Foolish Endeavour, like I haven't read anything like 
an absolutely remarkable thing, obviously except the sequel because it's what Hank Green wrote. So they both felt comforting in that they were familiar, but they both did things that like kind of change up the narrative. Um, this probably more so. But yeah, they were just very good sequels. <laughs> and then the final bookish superlative is most likely to succeed. And this is a debut author that like, a debut author to watch is what Boston has written. So like, the author that you think is gonna just like soar. And it has to be Elle McNichol. This girl, woman, Emma, she's a woman. <laughs> Elle is absolutely incredible. Incredible. That was really cringy. But Elle's writing is impeccable, her way of telling stories and conveying emotion. And what I love is obviously this is a middle grade and it's talking about autism, which a lot of kids that are neurotypical will not understand or know about. You know, if they don't have someone in their family that's autistic, they're, they're just not gonna know. And Elle somehow manages to quite bluntly tell you what things mean. Like she'll be like, you know, like, Addie, like I'm autistic, this means. And in a lot of books that can be really, really jarring. And I don't know if it's because Addie's autistic and Addie's our narrator and you'd kind of expect that from an autistic person, but it just, it just works so well. Elle has a new book coming out called Show Us Who You Are. Show Us Who You Really Are. I can't remember. Listen, I'm just too excited about it. <laughs> but I want to see, when's it coming out? I don't know if we have an actual release date. I just know it's coming <laughs> and I just, I can't wait. Like, I feel like Elle's gonna be that middle grade author that like everybody is reading. You know, like everyone's like, oh, middle grade Elle McNichols. So my neurodivergent heart is just so happy to see another neurodivergent person, specifically autistic person, doing so well. And then we're just gonna move on very quickly to my sort of best, worst, surprising, disappointing. So we'll start with worst, then we'll go to disappointing, then surprising, and then best. So if you haven't worked out what my worst book is, I'm pretty sure it's still my pinned tweet on Twitter. <laughs> um, I'm not even gonna put a picture up or anything, but it is the book Finding Sam by Mary Blackwell. I wasn't planning to talk about it so much on my channel, but I just, <laughs> I feel like I need to document somewhere just how bad this book was, other than my Twitter thread that I'm still getting notifications on nearly two months later. So Finding Sam's about this boy who, I literally can't even remember his name. He's neurotypical and his older brother is autistic. And this boy, the sibling, he, our main character, has an imaginary brother called Sam. And I can't remember what Sam stands for, but it's something like super awesome, like it's meant to be like my super, like super awesome, oh, I can't remember what the M is, but it's basically standing for like the brother he wants. And it just, ew. the whole thing was awful. As I say, my pinned tweet on Twitter is me reading this book with extracts because everyone was being all like, oh, give it a chance before you shun it because the blurb was really bad. So I was like, I'll take one for the team. I'll review it, I'll read it. Someone else, Lily from Home From The Lost, who brought my attention to it, she started reading it, had to stop. Someone was reading just my extracts that I was sharing on Twitter and had to call their crisis team because it made them feel that unsafe and just, it was horrible. Um, just some of the stuff that was coming out, it was very aggressive. And what I think really upset a lot of us was this author has an autistic son and it was a bit like she was projecting her feelings and, do you know, I don't doubt that she does love her son, but it's very much in an autism mom way where she's like, oh, my poor son is suffering so much and I must cure him rather than just encouraging and uplifting him as he is and supporting him that way. And it was a whole thing. And I, I, I only read half of the book because I refreshed it because a page was missing and then the whole book was gone because the publisher was like, oh shit. Just in case anyone asks in the comments, because I did have a couple of people kind of saying this at the time of the thread, like why did I publicly blast it, share excerpts of an arc, which you're not supposed to do, rather than discussing with the publisher? I offered straight up. I made it very clear in my email to the publisher that I wanted to work with them and help them if I found any issues. I, you know, said I was willing to come to them before I posted anything publicly and the, like, chairman of the main head guy in the company basically shot me down like, this book's amazing, this book's amazing, this book's this, it does this, it's it's not harmful, um, yeah, just review it so that we get, like, word of mouth. They just wanted me to publicise it, so I was like, fine, you don't want my help, like, I, I literally offered 
to work with the author as like a sensitivity reader slash autism consultant for free, okay, free. And they didn't even acknowledge that I, they, they didn't even say like, oh, thanks for the offer, but like, we're good. They just ignored it. So I was like, I'm putting this on blast. <laughs> so that's what happened. So yeah, that book sucked. Moving on. I have two disappointing books of the year and honestly one of them isn't even that disappointing. So I've included Blood Water Paint by Joy McCulloch. I think this disappointed, like it was a, was a three star read? I can't even remember. This disappointed me in that I kind of thought it was going to focus more on art um, but it was very much more on the historical and feminist side of things. Now that isn't bad, it just isn't what I wanted. It was a very hard hitting read and I did find it a little confusing because while it's a novel in verse there are scenes in like in chapters in prose, so like a normal book, and I wasn't really sure whose perspective we were reading from. The poetry is from Artemisia Gentileschi and in it she's like drawing certain people like the Madonna, Judith, Susanna, her like, I don't know, I'm assuming some sort of biblical figure or Roman figures or something that, you know, kind of like, not even myths, but like they're the stories of these women that people tell and whatever. And she paints them and then some of the prose sections were like about Susanna talking about Judith and then some of them were like Judith and I was like, I don't understand what's going on. So I was just a bit confused and like, I'm on the fence if I want to keep this around haul because I'm trying to be quite strict and be like, right, if I don't feel a connection, get rid of it. But there is something about this that I'm like, want to keep. So maybe it's the artist in me. I don't know. Hands down though, I think the most disappointing book for me this year was The Boy Who Steals Houses by C.G. Drews. Strangely enough, my worst book was an autism book by a non-autistic author. And my most disappointing is an autism book by an autistic author. I always feel a little bit hesitant talking about this. Like, it's an own voices book and I'm an own voices reviewer who didn't like it. Um, so obviously I've got to be cautious. So I was buddy reading this with Nina and neither of us being autistic particularly like this. Now, the author is AFAB, at least. I'm not, like I don't 100% know their gender. Like I, not my business, um, but I know they are AFAB. This book is about a boy who is not autistic. However, I did read an interview where C.G. Drew said he's undiagnosed autistic and like I see it but it also looked really forced towards the end where I was like you're trying to make him out to be autistic and he's not. Doesn't help that his name is Sam and I was like Sam? Finding Sam? But Sam's brother is the autistic and diagnosed autistic character in this and I just hated how he was written because he w we were made to believe that he required additional support, like a lot of extra support, and that he couldn't be independent and that maybe, you know, his cognitive abilities were like, he was at a lower age than he like actually was. And, and then later on in the book he's like going off and doing stuff himself and I'm like, so what is the situation? Like one minute he was written like a stereotypical low functioning autistic human. I We don't use functioning terms so like I'm just I can't actually think of another way to use to phrase it right now um, and then next thing you know he's like fine he's not even he's like he, sometimes he doesn't even appear autistic and I'm just like you know it's fine to have an autistic character who doesn't appear autistic but like one or the other like he can't be like three things at once and I just I don't know I just didn't fight with it and in the end Nina and I we kind of had the feeling that perhaps because it was a non-male person writing male, that's where the issue lies. Because obviously there are going to be exceptions and then, you know, you factor in like intersex and the fact that some people, you know, like if you're not cis and if like trans people, different experiences, you can tell I'm really struggling to get my words out. Obviously we all have different experiences and just because you're assigned male at birth doesn't necessarily mean you're going to present in male ways and like stereotypical ways. <laughs> I'm, getting, I'm getting very confused. But basically it's very well documented that females and males will present like autism differently. So it very much read like someone trying to write an autistic person having just like Google researched autism. Obviously I don't know what CG Drews did, like I don't know if they spoke to a number of um, yeah, maybe like cis men 
about their experiences but it just it didn't read that way it read like a non non-typical wow <laughs> it read like a neurotypical person writing an autism book it wasn't harmful I will give it that like it's not bad representation it's just it wasn't the best I just I feel really conflicted like I don't want to be like oh this isn't a good book it wasn't good to me it disappointed me it wasn't representation that I felt was not that I didn't feel it was accurate it just felt quite stereotypical I think this will be fine for neurotypical people but for autistics there's better rep out there I may be wrong I do know autistic people that have loved this book yeah just disappointed me then we have our most surprising the first most surprising book is the seven husbands of evelyn hugo and i'm still mad that i like this because i hated daisy jones and the six okay i got like very very early access to that book because i do like stuff with penguin like i don't even i don't even know how it came around but like i do like I, it was like a focus group thing <laughs> um and i just did not vibe with that book did not like it and then obviously it got published and everyone was raving about it and I was sitting there like this book fucking sucks and so I was so adamant I wouldn't like Seven Husbands but I was like do you know what I'll just give it a go someone gifted me or I don't even know but I was like I'll give it a go and I liked it and it has explained why I don't like Daisy Jones and the Six and it's because Daisy Jones is trying to be Evelyn Hugo and it's just not Evelyn Hugo like it just I think Taylor Jenkins Reid's trying to make a sort of niche with that type of story, like interview kind of biography thing, and it just it ain't it for me. Um, but I did like Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo, so hmm, that was a shock. And this is only here because like I wanted to talk about it, I'm kind of stretching it, um, but we have The Casey Warlow Weekly by M.N. Jolie. This is only here in the most surprising because it's a five star read that's self-published, and I know that is just like so oh like what, what's the truth stereotypical I suppose it is it's me stereotyping self-published books it's not even that it's the fact that this is like a paranormal book and I was like I love it and like I've been talking with the author um he's supposed to have his like the sequel coming out soon but he's had to push it back and I'm like it's fine but I'm desperate to read it which is so not like me so this also has autism rep our main character um Leap Fuck, Levy, Levy, Levy. I can't even remember how you say his name. Um, <laughs> he is autistic, Emma and Julie's autistic. It's just a great thing all around. We, we love it. And finally, we have my best books of the year, of which there are four. There, as I say, there could be a few more that go on the list. Some of, I'm seeing some of them might be a stretch. I don't even know what's going on at this point. What the fuck is TCC? See, this is the thing, right? I've put books on this list and I'm like, I don't fucking, oh, I know what it is, it's fine. So, for my best books, I'm only including books that I've read for the first time this year. So, A Kind of Spark makes this list because I read it for the first time this year as well as rereading it. But The Fox and the Star doesn't make it because I've reread it like three times now. It's obviously a favourite. Um, but yeah, the, a little, what am I saying? A Kind of Spark, I've talked about this, I love this. One of my favourite books, hands down. Another book that I've already talked about is an absolutely remarkable thing. Again, a book I read for the first time this year and then reread. I just, this is like new adult sci fi. It's just different to any other kind of book I've read, and I need more from Hank Green or I need more books like this. So get your Rex to me, please. The next book, did I say I have four? Because I have five. I can't count. The next book on my list will please Molly very, very much, and that is Potkin and Stubbs by Sophie Green. This is a middle grade kind of mystery. It was just fun. The cover is gorgeous, but I just, I love it. Then we have another <laughs> book with autism rep. This is another Own Voices book, and I fucking love it. Queens of Geek by Jen Wilde. But this was just the most fun. I was particularly missing Yalk in BookCon when I read this. I was just like missing the vibe, missing the atmosphere. This is set in a comic con. Oh, I loved it. I actually know of someone who's autistic who did not like this book. They did not like the rep and I was like... So it just shows you like how, one, how different people with autism are because all our experiences are different. I really related to this others haven't like you know but it also just shows you how subjective reading is as well so like this could be on your worst books of the year list and you know what 
ain't gonna hate you for it. <laughs> my penultimate best book of the year is The Infinity Courts by Akemi Don Bowman. Again, a sci-fi. Emma's getting into sci-fi. <laughs> and this obviously doesn't come out until 2021. This is just chef's kiss. Another case of a series where I am dying for the sequel, which you know is great when the first book isn't even actually out yet, but love this. And another book we've already discussed purely because it made me cry. I think my best book of 2020 has to be The Travelling Cat Chronicles by Hiro Arakawa. <sighs> this just did things to me. It was wholesome, it was emotional, it just... I knew, I, I, I kind of called it, I was like, oh, I bet you it's gonna be this. But it's the scene where it like happens and I was like, no. <laughs> but this was just impeccable and I I love it and I'm even more annoyed now that the rats, a few weeks ago, the rats chewed the back of it and I was like, oh, it's fine. And now I'm like, good job keeping it. <laughs> but that is it. Those are my best, worst, most disappointing, most surprising and bookish superlatives for 2020. Um, Here's hoping I read just as much, if not more, in 2021. Hopefully more books that I just absolutely love and I'll see you next year. Maybe with a new intro because I'm really not vibing with hi everyone. It feels really obnoxious so we got to think of something new. Um, I'm going to go clean these books up. I'm going to go read my book to finish for the end of the year. Film tomorrow's video. <laughs> oh my god, edit and upload this. Shit! <laughs>